Hi everyone and welcome to this panel about women in security career panel. Uh, my name is Caroline Solskjær and I will be the moderator. I work as a community manager at Detectify and specifically at Detectified Crowdsource. And Detectified Crowdsource is kind of a bug bounty program but with a little bit of a twist. So instead of targeting specific companies, we are targeting commonly used technologies instead. And my background, I actually started as a sailor when I was 14 years old and did that for nine years. Uh, but after doing that for a while, I realized it was time to do something new. So I started to study business and computer science. And after that, I've been working in the tech industry. And for all of these years, I always been very interested in working with the questions around diversity and inclusiveness in the tech industry and done a lot of work around that. So believing this panel today feels really great. But we're not here to talk about me. I'm joined with four amazing women, Aspen Lindblom, Katie Paxton Fear, Chrissy Morgan and Alyssa Pereira. I'm really honored to have you guys here and I thought we could start with just a short presentation where you can tell a little bit about yourself and maybe also why you started with hacking. And I thought maybe Aspen, you could start. Sure thing. I'm Aspen Lindblom. I currently work at CrowdStrike as a threat analyst. And before CrowdStrike, I was working in IT for a couple of years, like eight years. And I got started into, um, I, got, I got interested in, into security there because I was around for you know, ransomware. It was like big deal back then. Uh, it still is. And uh, we had customers who were just getting hacked. And being in IT, I had no idea how they were getting hacked. And it was just that, that curiosity of like, how is this happening? That eventually led me to switching to cybersecurity. And that's uh, a very short story of how I got into cybersecurity. Amazing. And uh, Katie, how about you? Um, so I've been doing IT for around 18 years. I started in help desk when I was quite young. Um, but it's only like the last seven years that I've actually really taken an interest into security research. Um, so I've taken part in CTFs, which have been really useful, um, massive learning curve. And now I spend my personal time developing my skills further. Um, I just really like to figure things out, how they work, can I make them do things they're not supposed to? That sort of thing. Um, it's just a real interest and a passion for me, really. I, I now work uh, as an information security officer in the daytime, but I do a lot of security research in the evenings. And Katie, how about you? Uh, I am a PhD student at Cranfield University, um, which is really how I got started in security. Uh, former data scientist, um, and my PhD is about uh, NLP and cybersecurity, so machine learning. Uh, I got into bug bounty specifically in June last year, and I've been an occasional bug hunter since. And also, I make YouTube videos full time. I am still waiting for the Nobel Prize Committee to get back to me for my for my entry of more hours in the day. So I'm still waiting on hearing back from them. <laughs> Amazing. I'll hope they answer soon. <laughs> and Alyssa? Um, I'm, I'm Alyssa. I currently work as a senior security engineer for Zoom. I started bug bounties when I was around 16, but my first, I guess, taste of security was around when I was in middle school, playing around the school with your laptops and all that. Great. And I mean, you all have different and very interesting backgrounds in how you got into hacking. Uh, but what is it that uh, motivates you to hack? I'll take a step uh, first or Katie, you were go <laughs> Okay, um, I would say I really like to learn new technologies and, and learning something new and um, almost like solving a puzzle. That and plus, I also want to make, it's going to sound really cheesy, I want to make the world a safer place for my kids. Uh, so that's why I like to hack as well as I like to learn. And 
there is some excitement when you kind of break something that you really shouldn't. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm in it because drugs are illegal and hacking something and getting that high of finding a bug and knowing, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. This is incredible. How do they develop and let this in? The rush of it um, is great. And that's why I hack. I love that feeling of trying to do something for a really long time and then cracking it, like cracking the case. It feels incredible. And it's just the most motivating thing. And I feel like I'm the smartest person who's ever existed. <laughs> and it gets duped. So that I don't. <laughs> yeah, like I said before, uh, with me, I like figuring things out. Um, but I also think that deep down inside me, there's a quite a protective instinct. Um, so from my previous career, it's come in and now I like to protect things during the day as well as breaking things also. So it's that part. I guess for me, it would be primarily learning, but also as the other panelists have said, to sort of make the place world, a world a better place as with all these three breaches you always constantly hear in the news and all that. Yeah. And when you approach a company, what, um, uh, what do you look for? Anything specific that you think uh, this is a, this is a good way to start when you're looking for something or when you're finding a specific target? Having a VB. For me? <laughs> <laughs> Safe harbor is always a good start. <laughs> um, I don't look for VB. I, or, um, what I like to look for is if they have apps. Oh, or APIs. Uh, that's usually if I see uh, that in the scope, I'm like done. I'm there. I'm going for it. For me, it's all about communication. I like to work with uh, programs that will work with me and ones that I know will kind of, especially when I was just starting out last year, one that would be quite friendly if I didn't quite understand everything and one that would be quite understanding. So for me, it was a lot about finding those programs that want researchers to go and look at them but also when you do they're not going to be really dismissive or be like sorry you're not you're not a pro I'm not interested but far more you know being friendly and responsive and being genuinely wanting to work with a hacker instead of just forget they exist until they find a bug. Yeah, I think uh, I think it was you, Chrissy. I saw uh, a talk that you did when you compared. I don't remember his name. But it was some some old guy from the eighteen hundreds or something who picked lock. Yeah. And yeah, I thought it was a really great uh, comparison of uh, being a hacker and and picking locks. <laughs> yeah, old school hacker. Um, yeah. He did his thing. And it's quite good. And I mean, on that talk, I, I spoke about obviously because my comment was read UP in place and a safe harbor. Um, and corresponding with what Katie's saying, find somewhere that, you know, ideally is part of a bug bounty program for me, because I do a lot of research that isn't part of bug bounty programs. So uh, finding someone that's accommodating of that and can have communication and can be empathetic that you are a security researcher telling them and trying to help them um, has always been a very good thing, because sometimes you just find things as you're going about your daily life, you know, and then because you're part of this industry, you want to explore it further. So having that in place is always a good sign. Definitely. And I mean, when, you, when, when we talk about hacking, there's a lot of uh, focus on the, on the technical sides and on actually uh, coding. But uh, at least I thought it would be really interesting to hear your point of view, since uh, from what I understand, you actually don't code that much. Um, primarily when I started, there was really no interest in programming, as it always seemed as a bit too abstract of a concept for me to understand. But through, I guess, through various capture the flags and sort of playing around with bug bounties and things like that, I've sort of realized that the, necess the necessity to use programming or understanding how to build things to break them isn't really always true, as there are other ways to approach it where you could simply understand how, how a website, for example, works and how things are processed through that without understanding how actually how it's would be in theory built. There's also a lot of vulnerabilities and 
ways you can f report and find bounties, for example, through methods that don't even uh, require any sort of intrinsic knowledge of coding or understanding how stuff works. Um, some of the easiest bounties I've gotten were simply through using a Google search engine and simply just searching for the right queries and finding sensitive data that was sort of left out in the open for a company's website, for example. Yeah, how do you others feel? Uh, do you think, um, like, what, uh, what other skills than technical do you think is important? Um, I think a big one is communication. I think people forget that once you find a bug, that's half the story. You also need to report that. And a lot of people who get into bug bounty are very technical people, and they assume the person on the other end is also the same amount of technical as they are. And I think one thing is if you're not necessarily uh, a technical person, you develop those technical skills. If you're a technical um, person, you have to develop those communication skills because half of doing bug bounty or even security in general is reporting your findings, making it clear what you found, how you found it, how it could be exploited, describing that impact. And a lot of the time, especially not just in bug bounty, but in further uh, infosec, you might end up in a situation where actually um, you can, you have to explain your findings to somebody who really doesn't care about security unless you put it in their terms. They're going to be your senior managers. You have to tell them you're going to lose a lot of money. And it's finding that right balance of, I think, communication skills. And if you already have those skills, then the technical stuff you can learn along the way. But communication is really, really key. And people always forget that. Yeah, Katie, like whenever you talk, I'm always like preach because you're like always on fire. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like in church, but you're absolutely right. I was going to say the same thing. Written communication is so important. If you can document and, and like fully like detailed, you know, of, of, you know, to reproduce what you did, not only that, but explain why it's important to someone just, just like either because you're trying to deliver this to uh, an executive, they have to buy in that this is a problem. And if you can't convey why it's a problem, then they're not going to listen to you or they're just going to disregard what you say. So yeah, Katie, you're 100% accurate. Uh, yeah, I agree as well. Uh, just to add to that, uh, patience. Patience is very important because you will find yourself that you may need to wait out for a little while and having effective communication while you <laughs> keep up that patience <laughs> while the process goes on, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a big skill to, to master. Definitely. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to uh, you and your specific careers because you all have very different backgrounds and you do very different things. So what, what areas do you specialize in and, uh, and why? Maybe, and maybe Chrissy, you want to start because when we talked about this earlier, you told me that you are now going more in towards uh, hardware hacking and IoT. And I thought that sounded like a really interesting area. Yeah. Um, so I come from a physical security background also. Um, I used to be the bodyguard and I like things physical, um, home security systems, alarms, that sort of stuff. And it was one of the main things that actually drew me to uh, doing further research. Um, I started with RFID hacking and continued on from there. Um, and now I'm interested in IoT um, devices, uh, which brings a whole spectrum of skill sets that you need. So web, mobile, hands-on stuff, embedded systems, um, you know, you also have the code, the firmware, and, and it's just so interesting. Um, but it's very therapeutic at the same time because I love getting a device and then open it up and then working with it and I find that very relaxing. <laughs> it's not like coding, which is sometimes a bit frustrating. Um, but definitely, um, I find it very, um, a very diverse area to work and it always keeps me interested. Um, so yeah, that's that's me now. How about uh, how about you, Alyssa? What uh, what do you specialize in right now? I guess currently I'm currently doing more yes intelligence gathering type stuff as that has been sort of been like reconnaissance sort of intelligence gathering sort of finding information and data that's not exactly supposed to be out there and that's sort of been the more interesting stuff I've been playing with recently as quite a lot of the vulnerabilities I've been finding lately has been 
lots of that sort of data leakages that are not exactly supposed to be out there or using publicly breached data that's been known for other websites and using, you know, reusing hazards have been reused with different companies and things like that. And sort of applying that to, you know, various administrative panels for companies that might have might not have changed their passwords for things after a breach, for example. So that's sort of what I've been focusing on currently. And uh, you, Katie. So like Aspen, I'm a big fan. And anyone who watched my videos will know I'm a big fan of APIs. Uh, I used to be, uh, when I was doing data science, it was kind of half my job. The other half was as a developer. So you're bog standard web developer. So I know a lot. And almost when I see like an API endpoint, my brain goes into developer mode. And it's like, I can understand how I would program that. And to be quite honest, the mistakes I would make programming that. So for quite a lot of it, for me, I really enjoy that because there's a ch big challenge there of actually doing things like finding all the API endpoints because they're not necessarily that obvious. Um, but actually, I really like the kind of being able to piece it together in my mind like a puzzle and really seeing that full picture view come in and using my developer skills as well, thinking, oh, yeah, that looks weird because I wouldn't do it that way. And this is what I'd expect it to look like, but it doesn't look like that. And then using that knowledge to then find a bug. And Aspen, do you want to uh, <laughs> share anything yeah. that you specialize in as well? <laughs> um, so I don't have much experience with web development or, or developing APIs either, uh, but I'm surrounded by APIs at work. So I, I clung to that because I was familiar with that as well as reverse engineering. Um, I reverse engineer malware and scripts uh, for work. And so I, 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 when I had the opportunity to do that, to learn it with Android apps, because it's easier than iOS at the moment, for me at least, uh, those are the two areas that I you know, went for. And then once I realized that you know, uh, Android apps uses APIs, I was like, just no brainer. I just have to go with the Android apps. Uh, so that's what I focus on. And I, I probably spend too much time in the learning phase before I start attacking, but I really like to understand how it works and then I can figure out when it's misbehaving uh, once you understand it. So that's what I focus on. Cool. And uh, I thought we should talk, or Alyssa, do you want to say something? No, okay. <laughs> Um, I thought we should talk a little bit about uh, interesting vulnerabilities and bugs that you have found. And I was thinking about you, Katie, because uh, I've heard about your actually your first bug that you ever discovered, or it was two of them uh, from Uber. And I thought that sounded as such an achievement, your first bugs, and there were two and they were at Uber. So could you tell a little bit more about that story? Yeah, I was really fortunate that um, I got to be a mentee at one of the hacking hacker one live hacking events uh, in London. And I remember going down the train, I brought my colleague with me and I was like, I'm not finding anything. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> this just sounded like fun. Um, and I was like, I'm not gonna find anything. It's fine. Um, and we we went in, we had like this tour of Burp. I'd never used Burp before. I had the option to do a cybersecurity course in university and I turned it down because I thought it would be too difficult. Um, so first time using Burp, um, I was playing around with a mobile app and I was kind of just poking at it. And then I realized something that one of the requests looked a little bit different from how the rest of the other requests looked in the app. and as a developer, that really does set off my brain a little bit. Like something looking a little bit different to me means that it was implemented differently. So I did that. Um, I was po poking it around. I thankfully had a hacker one mentor with me who was kind of telling me, oh, try this, try this, try this. Um, we have actually found that it was an IDOR, which is a really fancy term, which just means that you can access a resource you shouldn't be able to access. And it was great. And the problem we had then was, okay, how can we, how can we exploit this further? And I was just playing around in the app and taking a lot of different requests and thought, oh, I'll make that number zero, 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 zero. Uh, I'll make it 2 million. And it worked. And I'd managed to like change some pricing stuff. Um, so not only when uh, could I like do the initial idol, but I could also 
mess around with some number and quantities. And then it was like, okay, what made that negative? And then Uber owes me lots of money. And that also worked. And oh my God, we were literally, so I did that. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I found my first bugs. So we get to like the very last, and while talking here, the last five minutes of the life hacking event and me and my mentor are both stressed out and we're trying to write up the report. I've no idea how to write a report. We're trying our best. Literally, we submit the report one minute before submissions close. Uh, and I'm shaking. I'm shaking so much that I can't even think. He has to go have a cigarette because it's just been way too stressful for him to deal with. And we're both, we finally calmed down. And then uh, one of the um, like people running the event came up to us and had a laptop in his hand. Uh, and I was like, what? And he's like, I'm giving you a bug. And I... I exploded in happiness. That was the best feeling ever. I was like, oh my, no, no, <laughs> no, this is not happening. Uh, I don't know if they're particularly interesting bugs technically, um, but for me, that was like the highlight of 2019 for me. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's always like, I remember because I did a lot of social engineering before and I remember the first time I entered like a building and got into it. And I was like, I'm here. I'm actually in. <laughs> And I'm I mean, a late like, hacker now. Yeah, exactly. I'm buying yeah. the black hoodie. Yeah. I've done it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's such a great feeling. Amazing. <laughs> so, how about you others? Do you have any particular? I mean, it doesn't have to be like the coolest bug, but the memory that really wow, that was uh, was a great uh, great moment. Uh, some of the stuff that I work on, um, I work on stuff that other people have already established vulnerabilities. So you'll find things like defrock credentials and stuff like that. Um, recently went through a pro process of reverse engineering a DVR, which is the brains of a CCTV system. Um, and that was pretty cool because I learned to do an awful lot of different things and attack vectors. And what you'll find within devices is that you're still using the same pen testing methodology on these devices, but then there'll be a little bit of extra things to do. Um, so one of the interesting things you find remote backdoors um, as well, which is interesting. Um, so one of the DVR boxes that I had had port 23 closed. Um, I had to walk away from the device and that was at Christmas. And then a couple of months later, um, a very talented researcher, Vlad, found um, a way that you could pop it back open. And that was by uh, running a script and working with um, it's communication on its back door to pop it open. So then all of a sudden you now have access to port 23 and you can have remote control of the device itself. Um, so that's been quite interesting. And then you find other devices where you'll find that they're having default credentials, but also keeping hold of your credentials as well. So every time you're resetting your password and changing it, they'll keep a copy on the device. So if somebody pawns your device, not only have they got your device, but they possibly have passwords for all other devices because you could reuse those passwords somewhere else. So that's that's something that I'm working on at the moment with a, a doorbell thing that I've got. Um, but yeah, it's always, always fun stuff to find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. How about you, Aspen? Do you have anything particular in mind? Yes, uh, it was outside of Hack of One, and uh, I can't go into too much details, but it was an API IDOR where, you know, I had two separate accounts, and I was like, can I access data from, you know, from account ABC to, you know, CDE or whatever, and I could. I could access their data, and I could even delete their data, and um, that was not good. But uh, that was it. It, it. it was outside of Hacker One, and that's why I, I. It was really exciting when I found that out. Like, yeah, I love, I love API address. It's my first one, and my first very one. I couldn't like publicly talk about it <laughs> or go into details about it. But you know, that's my only thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And uh, and you, Alyssa, do you have any anything that comes to mind? It's not exactly a um, like vulnerability report or whatever, but it's a you know vulnerability I worked on for Detectify, um, with the post secure vulnerabilities that were you know first talked about by Orange Sai. The the entirety of, of it, the vulnerability, like the actual exploit details, weren't actually released at the time, but I sort of found it interesting enough to want to actually collaborate with some other 
um, security researchers to well figure out how the actual X X way works. And this really led on this several day journey of um, not only like um, reverse engineering, pull secure like files and things like that to understand how it all works to further find the vulnerability and how to actually exploit it. This sort of led to you know developing tools to um, exploit this vulnerability automatically without any much effort. And this sort of led to just reporting on the numerous um, vulnerability platforms at the time as, as, though, as though the vulnerability was patched many, many months ago, it was still vulnerable and many of us have never actually fully updated either. And that's sort of one of the things with vulnerability programs in general and I guess bug bounties too is that a lot of companies will not exactly update stuff as they should be. And, you know, even old vulnerabilities and you can even find, you know, websites that are still running very outdated WordPress instances or plugins that should have been updated a long time ago. And, you know, these sort of vulnerabilities are also very occurrent alongside, you know, the, the actual, you know, web applications they have that might be vulnerable to, you know, their own developed vulnerabilities and things like that. So uh, let's go in a little bit to uh, to diversity and and hacking and in the in the industry. Uh, when we talked a little bit earlier, uh, you, Chrissy, started to talk about the differences when going from one industry into another, and I think many of us have 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 experience with that. So can you tell tell a little bit more about your experience with that? Yeah, sure. So I've always worked in male dominated industries, um, and one of them has been when I used to be a bodyguard. Um, now, coming from an industry where physical attributes do matter, whether you're a male or a female, it's going to have a physical ramification on your abilities and how you do things. Um, it's interesting within that industry, um, the women and myself were more respected because we were able to do the same job. And moving into InfoSec, I didn't feel any different. I didn't see myself as a minority or in any sort of negative way. I've always just cracked on and got the job done. Um, but one thing that I did notice is that we're in an industry where physical attributes don't really matter because the only thing that we do share and what we need to use is our brain. So um, I think with that in mind, um, we need to promote more inclusivity. You know, what are the things that tie us together? What are the things that bind us um, as well as diversity as well? And I think that would help. Absolutely. Uh, what do others think about this? And I mean, it could be both like uh, things that are important to think about, but also positive things with uh, being a, a woman in, in, the in, in hacking or in tech. When we have discussions about diversity and inclusivity, uh, I think we get lost a little bit in this idea that we should be inclusive because it's a good thing to do, like it's a societal good. And that's absolutely true. Like not having women being able to enter a certain field because of something that they can't change, even if they're just as qualified as their male counterparts is bad. But more importantly, it's good business. When we think about um, bug bounty and security, we need people who think differently. We don't want people who all think the same, who have that same life experience because they can't find interesting security vulnerabilities. They'll all find the same thing. So having that diversity, you know, the geographical diversity, um, gender diversity, any kind of diverse way of thinking, people have different life experience, they're gonna find interesting stuff because they all have this different way of thinking. And I, I often think we get sort of caught up in, this is, this is good because it's good for society, but you know what, it's good business. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think it's so clear to see, especially uh, when, well, take uh, machine learning, for example, it can very, it's very clear sometimes that it's only white males who have programmed it because it's built for them and they don't notice anything else because it's, of course, I mean, you only, it's so easy to see your own perspective and forget everyone else. So to have all kinds of people, uh, especially in hacking, is important because then you can find things that the person who built it would never even think about. Um, yeah, I also come from a, uh, I work in a male dominated industry as well. I've always have been. And I always find that not just diverse in terms of, you know, uh, gender and ethnicity, but also backgrounds and, and where you are in the world. Uh, so I'm on a team that's globally, you know, just distributed. And when we all come together, 
we all have different perspectives like Katie mentioned, and we all tackle the problem differently. And that works so well because then we can actually get to resolution quicker than if we were all thinking the same or if it's just like, uh, it, it's just that just differences just actually helps move the needle further. Definitely. Uh, Alyssa, do you want to add anything as well? It's something I've noticed when, when as when I first started in the bike bound industry, there wasn't really many women in the field or bike bound industry itself. And part of the reason why I actually got into the field was primarily to at least in some way be a role model for other women in the field that was at the time still very much blossoming at the time. And looking at it now with many women in the field now and quite a lot of those diverse events that are you know, showcasing women or helping other women get into the field is quite, quite happy, to, quite happy, um, something that's very, very wonderful to see. Yeah, absolutely. So we're actually, unfortunately, uh, starting to run out of time. Uh, I, if I could choose, we could continue uh, the, com the entire day. <laughs> but uh, I thought it would be nice if you all could leave uh, the people who are listening with uh, some great advice or I mean, one thing that we didn't even touch upon was the networking and uh, how to actually get out there. So maybe you also have some short advice on like a great conference to go to or a great uh, community to go into, apart from, of course, Hacker One and Detectify. <laughs> any, any last words? <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd like to pick up on the networking part, uh, basically get to events when, when we can. Um, if you can't go to the in-person stuff, uh, attend the online events because it's the friendships and the bonds that you make where you will find that you're accelerating your learning. Um, and you can make you know good bonds that would actually help you career-wise, um, but just for getting to know the expert, experts in the area because that, and they're happy to help you as well some really good guys within the bug bounty scene and outside who are more than happy to to help you along the way um so yeah networking is very important my number one advice when it comes to learning something like in bug bounty specifically is what i'm going to focus in on is there are three steps to being a bug bounty hunter number one is to learn the tools number two is to learn the vulnerabilities and number three is to know where to find them. Those are the three things you need to learn if you want to do this. Um, and you can find all of that for free online. You don't need to pay. You don't, if you work better videos, if you prefer uh, kind of live streams, there is something out there for you. Just focus on those three things, tools, uh, vulnerabilities, how to find them and how to exploit them. My advice would be don't compare yourself to, to anyone else. You know, it's going to sound another cheesy thing. It's a marathon, not a sprint or a race, you know, um, and and during bug bounties, uh, it's a learning process and there's like a learning curve where like, you know, you're going really good and then you dip a little bit and you're in the valley of despair where you think that you know nothing and that you question your whole life choices. Don't give up when you get there. Keep going because in that despair, you're actually learning and you're growing. So don't give up. Alyssa, do you have any, any final words? <laughs> I guess the main thing is just be persistent, be willing to collaborate, be willing to ask for help from others. Um, primarily just be willing to push yourself and be willing to strive for what you think you can't do because you might end up surprising yourself. Definitely. So thank you so much, uh, Aspen, Katie, Chrissy, and Alyssa. It's been so interesting to listen to you. And uh, I hope that everyone who listened feels, feels the same because I felt I learned a lot and got really, really inspired. So thank you so much.